Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to VFX Graph Optimization Guidelines. I would like to know how many of you have used VFX Graph? Anyone here? Oh, good, good. At least, uh, how many of you know what VFX Graph is? Like some of you? That's good. So, VFX Graph is a node based tool to generate visual effects that run on the GPU. In this session, we will just take a quick look at how like an overview of how VFX Graph works internally. And we'll also take the opportunity to present the new instancing feature. And at the end, we'll just finish with some general performance tips. So my name is Gabriel. I'm here representing the VFX Graph team. And before Unity, I was working in games for a few years, always as a VFX programmer or a graphics programmer. So for BFS Graph, we like to divide the logic in two directions. So on one side, we have the vertical logic, which is a processing workflow that determines in which order the, the operation are performed. On the other hand, we have the horizontal workflow, which are the, proper, it's the, uh, the property workflow, which determines what kind of operations we have to perform. Let's start with the vertical logic. We have a succession of blocks, well, of, of nodes that we call context. And each one of them can contain blocks. This context uh, will execute one after the other. And internally, all the blocks will execute top to bottom. This, this uh, context, they will translate to shaders. So in some cases, it will be compute shaders. In some other cases, it will be uh, vertex and fragment shaders. Let's start with the particle system. Take a look at the context that are used by a particle system. First, we have the initialized context. This one is executed only when we have new particles and only on the new particles to set the initial value for them. Then we have the update context. The update context also translates into a compute shader that is executed every frame for all the particles of the system. And finally, we have the output context that is, run, is the one in charge of rendering your particles, and it determines the, the look of the, of the particles. In some cases, you can also generate a compute shader if you have some operations to do per camera. Like, for instance, you may need uh, sorting your particles, depending on the camera, or maybe some operations related to motion vectors. So let's start with the per first performance tip. We have three different types of context, and they all can have blocks. So if we, if we have one block, how do we know in which context it fits best? Because it may work in many of them, or in all of them, but the performance will not be the same. So in general, if you want something in the initialize, it means that either you're giving an initial value, or it's something that is not going to change, and just put it there. And because the initialize only run on new particles, it will be more efficient than putting it in the update. But many times, you just need something that it updates every frame like you're setting the velocity of your effect. So in that case, you will just put it on the update. In some other cases, you can just put it directly in the output. So let's say you want to set the color of the particle, just random color. You could put it in the init, but that will mean that you will save the value of, of that particle. You need to save it until it reaches the output. So why not put it directly in the output and save some memory? The next question will be, do we always need an update? Because sometimes you just want to scatter some particles around, like maybe some meshes. Because uh, BFS Graph is really good at that, at rendering multiple particles. So yeah, not, not really. So if you, if you don't have a, a, anything that changes with time, or they don't have a lifetime, they're always there, well, you may skip the, output, the update uh, context and then you're saving one the compute shader dispatch. 
let's continue with the horizontal logic. It's this kind of operation that you'll see here. And they connect with the, with the blocks that we saw before. So in the same way that we had a context and blocks before, now we have operators. They connect in between them, and they, they represent different kind of operations, from math, reading from textures, or all kind of different operations. So when you, you generate this, this graph, and then when you save it and you compile it, we take those operations, we simplify them, and generate a tree of expressions. Those expressions, they can run either on the CPU or the GPU, depending on the nature of the expression. So for instance, if you're sampling a texture, that will happen on the GPU. But if you're just doing some math with the, all the operations on the CPU, that will happen on the CPU. So if you're doing it on the CPU, that will happen during the update of the visual effect component. And then after that, it will be saved into buffers that will be sent to the GPU. But if the expression is running directly on the GPU, it will be the body of these compute shaders that we saw before. So we saw all the operations, but now we need to take a look at the memory. Where, where are all, all those properties of the particles stored? So the main place to look at is the attribute buffer. The attribute buffer is just that, a big chunk of memory where we have all the attributes for each particle. And there can be many attributes involved in a simple effect. So this is just an example of a fairly simple effect that will have many different properties. But not all the attributes need to be stored. So if you look at here, that's the, that's the layout of our buffer. We're saving the lifetime, the seed, the particle ID, position angle, velocity, and angular velocity. There's some other things, they don't need to be saved. Which leads to the next tip. You, you should try to keep that layout to a minimum. Why? Because first, that's memory. We have many particles, and you need to store these attributes for each particle. There's a lot of memory. And on the other hand, you need to read this memory on your shaders. So that's also had a performance cost. So it's always important to keep an eye on what you store on, the, on, your, on those attributes. Normally, it's not obvious, but there are ways to, to go around it. So like we said before, if you have something that will only change at the end, just put it in the output, uh, in the output context, and then you will not need to save it. Another thing to consider is to adjust the capacity. We've seen many times that users come and, and just use a huge capacity to not have to worry about how many particles, if, to, if there's en enough room for all the particles. That cannot go well because first, it's more memory we have for, uh, we have to store all the attributes for all the particles. And also, because during the update, we don't know if the particles are alive or not, we need to run it on the entire capacity. So if you set the capacity to one million particles, well, you will need to update the, the compute shader for that million particles. Another, another nice trick related to this is when you have a very addic attributes, that is like, let's say, uh, the rotation. If you have a rotation that has three axes, and you only rotate on the C axis, you can select the, the option to only save that C axis and store only one value instead of three. Another option that is not very well known is that we have in the preferences menu, we have the show additional debug info. This will show you for each block all the different attributes that are involved and even some source code that will be generated for it. You can find it like edit preferences, visual effects. So yeah, we're going good. Uh, we've been through half of the presentation already. And now it's time to present the new VFX instancing feature. There is a problem. Before the, this feature, there was a problem with VFX graph, which is when you have 
many different effects of the same type, it will not scale well. Why? Well, on one hand, the CPU, you need to update more components. We made the update uh, multi-threaded, but still, there's more work to do, and all of those components we gen will generate commands that then need to be se executed sequentially. So it, it will affect your CPU. On the GPU side, well, you will end up with many compute shader dispatches, which may be small, and it's not worth uh, the effort of, the, of generating the dispatch. Same for, render, uh, for draw calls. If you have many different components, you have one draw call for each one. The solution to this is VFX instancing. The way it works is very simple. When you create one effect, instead of preserving memory for one effect, we reserve for an, a set of effects. So this number of uh, effects in the batch can be tweaked or, or it can be computed automatically for you. But it will be a big chunk of memory that when the next time you create an effect, it will reuse that memory and put all of them together. Why is that? It's because then, when we're going to do a compute shader, we dispatch all of them in the same one. So potentially, you could have, let's, let's say this, this example, you have 128 effects that before we, we have three blocks for each one, so very small computes. And we have 128. It doesn't fit in there. The longest was, the list was very long in RenderDog. And then now you have one. So this is obviously an ideal case, but it's representative of something you can find in your games. The same for draw calls. Before, we had just very small draw calls for the effect. Like this, uh, this represents uh, this effect that you see here. So you have many uh, small draw calls. Well, now we have only one draw call for all of them. There, there are a few, in general it works automatically for you instancing, but there are a few things you can tweak. For one, make sure that it's enabled. By default, when you create a new effect, it will be enabled, but there are some cases where it might not be. So if you're using some advanced features like uh, GPU events, for now, it disables the instancing. We're working on that. We're trying to make that everything is supported with instancing. But at the moment, there are a few things that will disable. And then if it's disabled, you will see a reason in there why it is disabled. You can also manually disable it. And it will be the case if you just upgraded your project. Why we do that is because we don't want you to have a regression when you just install a new version, right? But you make sure that you go back and check your effects and enable it. The other option you have there is to select the size of your batches. By default, we try to guess a number. We look at the size of, the, of your buffers, of your effect, and try to say like a, a number that will work well, like not too big, not too small. But only you know what usage you're going to do of your effect. So if you know how many roughly you will have in there, or how, how would you like to divide those, uh, those uh, batches, you can come here and just set the number. And finally, there's one extra option on the component, because yes, generally you want to have batches of one certain size, but maybe you have one or, few, one or a few effects that you don't want to, to use instancing. Maybe it's just a preview effect that you have uh, in the scene, and you don't want to reserve 128 when you only want to be using one. So you just go to the visual effect component, check, uh, uncheck the allow instancing, and it will, be, it will be running a batch of one. And that's all it takes for VFX instancing. Right now, it's very automatic, very simple. But we are working on doing some more uh, debug information and giving you more control on, on the batches, maybe to have variable size of batches or uh, on, allow you to, to know where your instances are in which batches, which one are together. And now we will, because we still have some time, I think. Yeah, that was plenty. Uh, we have some extra performance tips of uh, general cases. 
the first one, the most obvious, is try to not do unnecessary work. So if you're, you have something transparent, sorting will be enabled by default. But sometimes you don't need the sorting because your particles are very far away from each other. Just make sure you go and disable it because it has a cost. You also have a very convenient uh, mode to select automatic bounds for you. But of course, it comes to a cost. So instead of doing that, you can use fixed size bounds. And if you don't know what to use for your bounds, we have an option that will record the bounds for you. It will play the effect for a little bit and compute the max size. On the bounce topic, it's important to adjust it properly. On, on one hand, if you make it too small, you will see it popping in and out of the screen when you move your camera. On the other hand, if it's too large, everything will look fine, but the effect will still be running when it's not visible, which is not ideal. The, on the other important part here is fill rate. Fill rate is usually the killing performance uh, feature of like any, any particle system, because we usually have transparent particles and we usually have a lot of them. So it can happen that you render the same pixel many times. The best thing is to check how much overdraw you have in the scene with the rendering debugger uh, tool. You can find it in Windows, uh, yeah, Windows Analysis rendering debugger. If you see there's a lot of overdraw, you can tweak the, your amount of particles, but you can also consider Switch, uh, instead of doing alpha blending, maybe try alpha clip plus this ring that it can work very well in some circumstances. We also have different kind of outputs. By default, the, the most common is the quad. But depending on your texture, you may consider using some others. Like in this case, you have like a circle. Instead of a quad, maybe you could try to use an octagon and cut corners, literally. And additionally, if you are in HDRP, you have some other options that you can take advantage of. For example, the most common one, it's very efficient one, is to use a low res transparent pass that HDRP has. You may not notice the, the quality difference, and it will, it will give you a boost in performance. If you have lead particles, you can also use the simple lead instead of the standard lead because it will give you a decent quality lighting information which is good enough for your particles. Finally, try to optimize your mesh particles. Why do I say that? Right now, every, time, uh, every uh, shader needs to be run on the vertex shader, so it means that all the expressions that you have on your output are run per vertex. So if you have a mesh that has a lot of vertices, well, it's going to take more uh, compute than uh, a smaller one. So just be mindful of the vertex count, which usually means try to use LODs when possible. We do have an option to set the LODs very, very easily inside of VFX graph. Another thing that may be less obvious is that you could enable indirect mode to just render the particles that are uh, visible. Otherwise, you may need to render some of them that are not visible. And that's it. The, yeah, it was a bit uh, less time than uh, expected, so that's good. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, one thing is uh, a reminder that we have another talk today at 5.20, I think, about the new six-way lighting. And it will be more entertaining if it's like with explosion and fire and all the kind of things we want to see in a particle system. If you want more information about VFX Graph, just get the link to a new website that's been renewed like a couple of weeks ago. Thank you so much, and I think we may have time for questions. Do we have any questions? Well, thank you, thank you so much.